I'm actually from Bozeman, Montana. And if anybody knows where that is, but, um, I go places where people don't know that we're in the state. The um, place I love. The temperature is just a little different than Hawaii. Uh, it, it's, uh, I think it was 44 below last week. And, and, um, so this is like, there was a 120 degree temperature change in there. And, uh, I think we were shoveling like a foot and a half of snow last week. Uh, but praise God, amen, I'm in Hawaii, so none of that's my words, amen, uh, praise God. Um, I have a beautiful wife named Tammy, uh, who pastors the church, she started back in 1999, and then I have four daughters, so I usually ask everybody to keep me in prayer, because I'm the only man in my house, amen, all right, and so I'm really blessed, so um, God's really good to us. Um, in that way, we have um, several ministries that we hear that we do. You know, one of our big passions, obviously, is reaching uh, children at risk, um, in particular focusing on rescuing uh, young girls um, and then some young boys, too, from sex trafficking. Um, we've been doing that for over 20 years now. And even though we really love uh, what God does in terms of His presence and being together, it's, um, sometimes it's hard to measure in a service or a meeting exactly all that God did in the human heart. Uh, but we uh, we have been able to see that we can tangibly see that our life has been rescued and changed. Amen? And so uh, at the end of our time together, I'll give you an opportunity also to respond to it if you'd like to help so into that um, as well and rescue our uh, kids. We've seen God do more even during the pandemic than we have, like even uh, you know, in times where there was more freedom to do things that felt like they um, God. God did lots of good stuff in them. Amen? Uh, at my back table, um, I have a, uh, this, uh, two things I think that my sister um, was, was helping me with. Uh, but, um, it's, I have a USB, it's called the Presence Pack. And I only have two of those. Uh, and um, everything else is sold out of a lot here. I preached 12 minutes before I got here and another other minister here. I'm a big guy in Montana. And so there's not much there, but if you want to order anything, you can. And it will be shipped to you free of charge if you get it here. Amen. And um, I have a book, uh, a lot of people mention that, called Shaking Heaven and Earth. And um, it has a lot of meat in it, um, really uh, to challenge you how to grow in, in your own relationship with God and hear the voice of God for yourself. Amen. How many know that hearing the voice of God is normal Christianity? Amen. Um, it's not odd at all. And then I also have uh, another USB. And when I say USB, it's like it plugs into your computer. You do call, you can download it on your computer and then onto your phone if you'd like to. Uh, but you can, whatever way you, you would like to use that. But that is a supernatural school. It has um, 66 different teachings on the prophetic, on, on healing, and on your identity in Christ Jesus. And the book is actually on there as well. Amen. So that's a lot, you know, if you really look at the like, you can really just saturate yourself and grow. Uh, that's the perfect thing also to be able to look at. Amen? And so I'm kind of done with my um, infomercial here. Um, and things, but we're going to jump into the rest of it. Amen? So praise God. It's good to be with you guys this morning. Amen? All right. Well, Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, we surrender to you. We yield to you. And we ask you, Lord God, to speak to us. We ask you, Lord, to open up our eyes that we would be able to see what we have not been able to see. To open up our ears so we can hear what we have not been able to hear. That you would open up our hearts, so that we would be able, Lord God, to function in a way that would be fruitful. And that people would see you and not just see us. In your precious name, Lord, we give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. And maybe I'll, maybe I'll show this part first because I, I, it's just stuff that I feel prompted with, but I just felt like the Lord said to me, and I, and I really hesitate in saying this in this way, but I felt like the Lord says a name change is coming. And I felt like the Lord says that, like, I, I felt like kind of like, like it was something going to be like, like you know, the house of glory or something to do with glory. What? <laughs> But so I know I'm trying. No, I'm not joking. I'm trying to tell you what I felt like the Lord was saying. But uh, uh, and and I and so and so I guess that means something by the reaction. Um, uh, 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 oh, exact name. Oh, wow, wow. I just thought it was kind of maybe symbolic or prophetic, maybe of what he was trying to declare. Oh, so you guys are actually looking to change your name. 
Yeah, so I, no, I didn't know that. You know, so I didn't know that. So I felt like the Lord was saying that, like, he was speaking to me about the name being um, synonymous with what he wants to do, right? Because there is that aspect of that. And I felt like there was this thing like the Lord was saying about the first being the last and the last being the first. And, and, and so I, I kind of felt like the Lord was saying I was changing that around and I felt like it had something to do with what he was going to do in releasing his glory, not just in a place, but you know, uh, but on the island, um, in, in, in Hilo, right? And that was a part of that wave, I think, that my sister was talking about, you know, um, because it was an overtaking of that. But I felt like the Lord says that, like, like, deliverance would not necessarily be the thing that you would be known for because deliverance would happen in the glory, amen? But, but like, when she's talking about the angels that are on top of the, the wave that are fighting, the glory is literally going to cause deliverance to happen in a way that is going to cause there to be a new freedom that's going to be able to be released at the other places. Amen? And so like the, uh, you know, he says the first, you know, the first will be last and the last will be first. You know, Hawaii is the last state, right? That was brought into like, into the nation aspect of things. And I know, I'm not trying to say that legalistically or, you know, I, I know there's lots of data out there about all kinds of things, okay? But like, but, but in saying that, I thought the Lord would say that Hawaii would be first, amen? And that that would be the sender of the glory and the presence. And Exodus 33, 20 came to mind where it says there, you know, like if any man sees my face, it says, it says that, that, that he will die. But the actual translation there in the Hebrew is something different because the word for face and the word for glory and the word for presence are all synonymous. They're one in the same, amen? And I thought, uh, and the actual language there in the Hebrew says, if any man sees my face, encounters my glory, or has experience with my presence, that they will be unable to remain the same. I felt like the Lord says, there's like a facelift coming, right? There's a, there's a facelift that is coming that is going to change the way that you appear, because it's going to change the way that you are and the way that you function, which is going to change the very aspect of a community. It's going to change in a way that he's going to be known, amen, it's going to, and, it, and it's going to be something that can go, but something that can be sent, and he will do it here in terms of even the nations. When we think about the nations, oftentimes we think about going to the nations, but the nations are going to come, amen, that's like Isaiah 60, right? The nations are going to come to you, amen, the, the, the presence of God would come upon you, and the presence of God, or the glory of God would come upon you, and the glory of God would be seen on you. I mean, does anybody still believe the Bible? Because that's what the Bible says he's going to do, right? And, and there's a promise of God in that, that the nations would come to you, amen? And the nations have come to Hawaii, uh, 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 but, the, but the Lord's going to touch the nations, going to touch the ethnos, and then there's going to be an explosion of God's glory in other places, amen? It's what God's going to use to launch, but he's going to so change us that we will not recognize ourselves, amen? You recognize that, but if you, so this is the difference between religion and the difference of, 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 of being in the glory and being in a relationship with God. See, religion causes you to have an experience in a, in, in a service or a meeting and yet you stay the same. You leave the same way. See, like, like when you're in experience with the glory and the presence of God and encounter Him, you leave different. You don't recognize yourself. Right? You are not the same. Okay? God wants to. God wants to redo what we have done in ourselves by undoing it. Amen. There's a deliverance that God is going to do in His glory. That's not going to feel like deliverance. It's just going to feel like a brand new identity because we're going to see the Father, amen, and we're going to see him for who he is, amen. So anyways, that's just something I felt like the Lord was prompting me uh, to share. I hope it means something to you. That's awesome. I'm sorry. I have oh. to tell you this. is just distorted. I it's apologize. too distorted for you yeah. to understand what I'm saying, amen. No. No, we got so we got I felt like that was a good word, but, um, really good word. but I might be the only one that really got the word, amen. All right. All right. <laughs> All right, well, well, praise the Lord um, <laughs> for that. Um, I'm going to jump into some other things, and then I'll, 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 I'll see what the uh, Lord does with it. But, um, you know, I feel uh, there's some things I'm going to share personally as well as, um, 
some stuff that I feel like God would just prompt me to share with you. And I've got too much in me to really figure out how to do it all in one. So I just got to try to back up and just give you what I can, okay, this morning. But, I, you know, I feel like I'm, you know, uh, I'm going to share uh, Psalms 91 in just a moment. But uh, my, um, my daughter called me in December. And she called me and she said, um, uh, Dad, this crazy thing happened tonight. <clears throat> and I didn't know what she was going to tell me. She usually talks to my wife first, but she talked to me um, first this time. My wife was busy, so I, I got blessed. And so she, um, she says, Dad, after work, she, she actually goes to graduate school. She's a writer. She lives in Boston. Uh, and she um, also teaches freshman English. And then she um, has an after-school program that she works with kids that are having a hard time going you know, with families and, 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 you know, tough situations and stuff. And so um, she, they keep her on even though she doesn't have time during the school year just because they like her. And they pay her even if she can't make it there, which I think is pretty cool. Like, I, I, they, nobody ever did that for me when I was 24. But uh, praise God for her. Amen, the next generation. But, like, um, so she calls me and she says, Dad, um, the ladies at, at this after-school program asked me if I'd like to go out. Um, and it was like a Friday night. And so she said yes, and she went out with these four ladies, and, um, and some of them were, they were drinking wine when they went out, and then one of the ladies said, hey, um, <clears throat> let's go back to my house and we can visit some more and stuff after they got done eating, and, and um, they get back to the house, and all four of the ladies are, are like standing in the kitchen, and um, my daughter, all of a sudden, she, she feels prompted to, to start to prophesy over the one lady. And when she begins to prophesy over then she starts to get words of knowledge for her. She doesn't tell them that she's prophesying. She doesn't tell them that she has words of knowledge. She's just speaking it straight from the heart of God, right? And as she does it, the power of God comes on all these women right there in the kitchen, and they all fall out, and they're laying on the floor under the glory and the presence of God. Amen? So, so the, the one lady that, is, that my daughter is speaking over, she says, Oh, my gosh, I thought I made this up in my head. When I was a kid, I went to church, and I felt like this thing happened to me, and, but I thought it was like my imagination that this wasn't real. And she says, wow, this is real. And then there's another lady that was also there that was on the floor, and my daughter said every time that she would try to share about God, the woman would get mad, and she'd start to curse God and use the F word and say, F God. And, and so, you know, it was really kind of in your face. And now she's laying on the floor under the power of God, and the presence of God, and the woman is exclaiming, wow, this is real. I'm telling you, like, God wants to come in ways that's different than what we have thought about how God wants to come. He's, he wants his presence to so be on us that he's going to show up in places that's not church, or it's not churchy, but he's going to show up in places. And God wants us to make room to see him and where it is that he's operating so that we can be able to be a carrier of that, and that we can just cooperate in what he is doing. Amen? He's getting ready to show himself in a way that's different. We've actually lost the ability to just see it happen from church. It's going to require us to be a people that are actually bringing things to our communities and to our people and, and, and to our, our families. Amen? And so, you know, in Psalms, in Psalms 91, um, you know, it, it says here, it says, he... Um, who dwells in the secret place of the Almighty. Like, um, dwells, that means that you live from that place. That's where you're supposed to be living, right? That's the foundation of your life, right? He who dwells in the secret place. And now, now, I shouldn't have to say this, but like, in some places you do. The secret place is secret. It's not the place that you go out of the secret place. Like some people kind of seem like they're teaching like if you go to the heavenly places, like you can't do the secret place here together. Okay? It, the secret place is where you are living. And, and, and as much as it's like I'm, I love, you know, gathering and worshiping, but God's looking for people that have a value for the secret place. Uh, uh, people that value that even more than all of the other things that we know. Amen? And, and, and those things are all things that, you know, that we're supposed to do, but we're supposed to have a higher value for the secret place than anything else. But it says, he who dwells, lives in the secret place of, 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 of the Almighty. It says, in my Bible, um, it, it's an amplified Bible, so it says, shall remain uh, fixed and stable. Like when I first gave my life to Jesus, because I did not come from a, a, a Christian background, uh, you know, I, my goal or, or what I prayed and asked God to do was to make my life consistent. 
You know, somebody was kind of, I think Pastor Kevin was saying something in regards to this, but like, you know, I didn't want all the drama, um, all of the, the stuff, like, to, to get me to react all the time. And, and so I'm up and really excited about Jesus one week and then down the next week because of circumstances, you know. And we need Christians that way right now that aren't reacting to newscasts and everything else. It's up and down, amen. That, that when we keep our eyes fixed on him, it keeps us stable, amen. We're not reacting. It's not causing us to get, you know, emotional and, and, and lose our cool kind of sort of speak but we're keeping our eyes fixed on him but most of your Bibles it actually uses the word abide right and, 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 and the word abide means something that is different than what some Christians believe the word abide means it's not just about staying like connected to God but it actually means to get to a place where you actually are doing what the father is doing and you're actually speaking what the Father is speaking. Now, what's really powerful about this, because I'm going to try to break some religious things in this, but like um, one of the things that's really powerful about that is that David wrote this over a thousand years before Jesus Christ ever came. Right? That's a big deal. He's already exhorting the people that they're supposed to be able to have a relationship with God where they can see what God's doing. And that they can hear what God's speaking. Then Jesus comes, and Jesus actually models what it means to abide. He demonstrates it to his disciples, and he and he says it. You know, it's a very popular verse. He says, "He says I only do what I see the Father doing. I only speak that which I hear the Father speaking." Right? Now, now that, there's no exception to that. There was not one time that Jesus was not doing what the Father was doing. There wasn't one time that he wasn't speaking what the Father was speaking. And I believe that he was demonstrating to us about how you and I were supposed to live. It wasn't just Jesus that was supposed to live that way. But he was demonstrating about how you and I were supposed to live in relationship with the Father. You try talking to a Christian in the middle of chaos and ask them what God's doing. And you'll find somebody throwing a tantrum oftentimes. I don't got time to hear what God's saying. I don't know what God's doing. I just got to do something. I got to make something happen. Don't you know how bad you know, things are? You know, I can't just sit around and do nothing. But if you don't know what God's doing, I mean, at some point, if you don't break that cycle, then you're going to constantly live a life of reaction. You're never going to live in the promises. God's trying to break a cycle, right? So, like, the best way to prepare is to figure out how to connect with him before, right? So that you can start to live according to what it is that he's doing. And then in John 15, Jesus actually exhorts us as a new covenant church that we're supposed to abide. There's, this was not just for Jesus. It was for every single one of us. That we're supposed to learn, you know. Now, I understand, like, sometimes people go, I can't hear from God. Well, I felt that way, too. I spent, I, I, I was talking to Pastor last night, and he said he'd already heard it. Um, I shared it somewhere, but, like, I spent 30 hours a week at one point with the Lord because I got tired of doing any ministry in and of my own ability. And I said, okay, God, if you're not going to do it, I don't want to do it. I wouldn't answer a phone. I wouldn't cancel, counsel with people. I was done pastoring. I laid on the floor of the sanctuary of my church at the time, and I said, God, if you don't speak to me, I'm not doing this no more. And so I was going after God at that moment, and I prayed for probably 100 hours at this particular point, like three and a half weeks into praying, and, and the Lord had not said one thing to me. I was so mad at God. Oh, I wanted to ball God out. I was, I was, I was, I was walking back and forth. I was pacing. I was like, God, I don't get it. Uh, you know, you're talking to everybody else, but you're not talking to me. And, and I was mad at God. And so, you know, and God didn't care about my tantrum. He didn't react to it. He didn't, he didn't, nothing, right? And so I gave up and I just kind of laid on the floor. Um, and I laid there and probably like a couple days later, I think it was, that the, that the Holy Spirit came to me and said, he asked me a question. He said, are you here um, to be with me, or are you here to see what I can do for you? Now, when God asks you a question like that, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. I didn't answer him. Believe me, all right? 
I was there probably for the wrong reason, right? And the Holy Spirit knew it. I was there to see more about what God could do for me. I wanted him to speak for reasons because, you know, there was things that I wanted to do or I wanted to see that. And I did, in that moment, I, I learned to give up. You know what happened? All of a sudden, God started speaking to me over the next few days. All of a sudden, I could hear him. You know what's keeping me from hearing him? My own will. My own agenda. My own heart. My own mind. You mean, like what happens if I read the scripture, but I get God's mind, but I actually don't get in his presence and I don't get his heart? Then people don't see him. Because they know the right thing, but they don't see the heart of it. Amen? It's not enough. Like God doesn't care if you do the right thing if you don't actually have the right heart. Now, I'm not, hear me clearly. I'm not saying God doesn't care about whether you do the right thing. But he, he is not a God like that lowers his standard. Like, he wants what we do to be who we are. Amen? Because that's who he is. Like, when Jesus comes into the room, he doesn't just heal people. That's who he is. He is healing, right? Like, he doesn't just provide for people. He is provision. Why can you come in and you can preach healing not knowing what God is going to do beforehand? Why? Because that's who he is. Right? He wants that of us, too. He doesn't want us just to demonstrate the things that we do is a right thing. He wants it to be who we are so that there's a release of, 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 of the essence and the identity of who God is. Amen? You know, like as much as we talk about identity today, like if you don't see the Father, you'll never know who you are. Even the Old Covenant says, you know, if you see him for who he is, then you will see yourself for who you are. You can't sing enough songs about who you are. You can't get enough prophetic words about who you are. You can't just build yourself up. There's a perversion of identity today really that's creeped into the church where it creates arrogance and it creates pride. But see, the true identity of God creates humility. Because when you actually know who you are, you don't actually have to tell anybody. There's no need to tell anybody because you already know who you are. You're not trying to make people believe that you are something you already know. So you can take a lower place than what you deserve and be totally okay with it because you know who you are. Again, and you know that he'll make a way. When, when, when you're supposed to do something, God will make the way. Amen? You don't have to make your own way anymore. And so this is the goodness, this is the goodness of who God is. But it says, he who, who, who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide abide under the, 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 the shadow of the wings of the Almighty, right? Like, like, and I used to think that was like a big eagle or something because I picture the wings of an eagle, but the Bible doesn't say that God is an eagle. But I love the next part of that. It says, it says, and no foe can withstand. Do you, do you understand like what God is saying? The enemy has no ability to attack you in this place. Like, you can be attacked if you want to live Christianity from a knowledge perspective that lacks revelation. I mean, that revelation knowledge, like, without the presence, it doesn't bring transformation. Amen? It requires us to have the presence of God on our lives. Amen? Like, you don't ever graduate from the glory of God. You don't ever graduate from the presence. Amen? Like, it's a lifelong place. Like, Jesus, you know, like, right now we have two things. I was talking about this, Pastor. We have two things that happens in the church. We wait on God, or, or we don't wait at all, we try to go do something. And, and, and it's supposed to be that we're waiting on God, and stuff comes out of that. We're not waiting for a big event. We're not waiting for the calendar to change. It's, it's, it's literally learning to live out of his presence, that you recognize God, that you create a sensitivity to God in his presence, that now when you go out, you recognize that wherever it is that you go, and you are participating in that. And God's looking for us to trust him in the small stuff before he gives us the big stuff. Amen? Because a lot of people, they're wanting to, I've, I've wanted this a lot of my life, and I'll talk about this in a minute. I want the big dream. I want the big vision. But God's looking to say, what can you do with the relationships that are around you? What can you do with the people that irritate you? What can you do with the people that make you mad or the people maybe you don't forgive or the people that like make you bitter or feel like they're an obstacle in your way? You know, God's looking. He's looking to see, can you, can you so change in a way that, that you can love them anyway and you can embrace that so that they can see that you're so different that they see the Father. You know, it's great training ground. But a lot of times we don't want that, right? Because we, we want the better thing. We want to get away from the thing that isn't, you know, it's kind of, you know, irritating. 
and, and we want to get to the place where it's the promised land. But, you know, there, there's a process of getting from where you are to where it is, and God knows how to get you there. How many believe that the presence of God is actually enough? Like, like, that's David's story, right, in the Bible. Like, God, he's not even on the radar, and God knows how to get him from where he is to where he's supposed to be. I think God's trying to bring the church back to a place where we don't believe in our own thing, in our head, that we think that if we're more talented or we're more knowledgeable or we're more connected, that, you know, like that we actually believe that God, and honor and value his presence has the ability to do whatever it is that he wants to do in our lives without us having to be in control. Amen? That's the purpose of being able to trust him. Amen? But the Bible says here that no enemy can touch you if you live this way. Which, which means that probably a lot of us don't live that way. <laughs> right? <laughs> and if we're just honest. Amen? Do you know that there's a place in God where you never have to ask him to bless you. Ever. It doesn't even need to come across your thought life anymore. There's a place like where the things you the things that you do, if they're what God is doing, if you're abiding, what God's doing is already blessed. Like what God's saying is already blessed. Right? And so that's why Jesus calls us to this deeper place of abiding in him. You know, I think about, you know, Matthew chapter 6, it says there, um, and I'll only talk about the second verse for the sake of time, but like, you know, in the first verse, um, verse 5 there, um, he's basically telling you not to do things to be seen by men, right? He's talking about your heart, and he says, if you do that, he says, you've already got your reward. How many of us are, are already living in our reward because we do things for the wrong reason? Like, I mean, the reality is like, it says not to be a hypocrite there. And sometimes I think, I'm not a hypocrite because I didn't grow up in the church. And because it's about the religious people. But the reality is, we're all hypocrites sometimes. I'm not trying to offend you. I know that, you know, I'm really good at offending people, uh, uh, you know, without trying to. But like, I'm talking about myself too, amen? Like, uh, you know, because all the, you, know, you can go to any restaurant in America and find hypocrites. Like sometimes people think, well, I don't go to church because there's hypocrites. Well, the reality is, all you have to do is go somewhere where they do things, but their heart's not matching up with the things that they're doing. That's, that's a part of being a hypocrite, right? That's why we're singing this song about I'm sorry, right? Like for going through the motions. Even though I don't like that word I'm sorry because I really think that we should get into what I think Pastor was saying, that we should repent when he was talking about being on his knees, right? And I don't know why repentance has become a bad word in the church. You know, it's like a lot of people, you're not even allowed to say that anymore. Like it's not PC enough, but like repentance just means changing your mind. It just means changing your direction. Like, I couldn't even stay married if I wouldn't change my mind. Let alone a relationship with God, right? I mean, I need to change my directions. And I mean, just to be able to have a relationship with people, it means that you need to change. I'm not sure why we think that's such a bad thing, amen? That's a part of growing, you know? It's a part of growing in a relationship with God. And the thing about God, you know, it's like, if, if he's, a, he's a lot like my wife. He's not wrong, Right? <laughs> He's not wrong very, you know, he, she's not wrong very often, but he's never wrong. Okay, okay, but like, you know, this, this is, I've got to learn to embrace that, that my whole life is about change. But when I get into his presence, right, all of a sudden, you know, that's why Pastor Kevin could be on the, sto on the floor, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh man, I can't sing this without like knowing that there's some things that God needs to adjust in me. There's some things that needs to change in me because my heart isn't necessarily there in the moment and I need my heart to get there. I mean, that's what God's looking for is the little adjustments that he can make inside of us. But in Matthew chapter 6, you know, Jesus says this. He says, he says, when you pray. How many know he doesn't say if you pray? He says, when you pray. And sometimes I think we get a religious connotation to prayer in some places, but like, you know, prayer just means to connect with God. That's what we try to do with each other, too. We're supposed to be connecting, Right? And we're talking about the friend of God this morning. I was thinking about that. Like, I know God's my friend, but sometimes I do ask myself if I'm a very good friend to him. You know, because, like, you know, you know, sometimes I go to God and I want him to know everything that's going on with me. But, like, a good friend, you know, have you ever been to coffee or dinner or, or lunch with a good friend or, or, or somebody they, call, they, they think you're a good friend and they don't ever ask you about you? You know, you, you go, go to have coffee and the whole time they just tell you all about them. And then, and then, they never ask you about your family. They never ask you, how are you doing or what's new in your life? And then at the end of the time together, like, oh, man, this was awesome. We should do this again real soon. And they're like, oh, I'm not sure I want to do that, right? Um, 
um, because I don't know if somebody cares about me. See, that's how we're supposed to be with the Lord. Like, the Lord, what's on your heart? What's on your heart today? What do you want to do? What are you thinking about? Who are you thinking about? (laughs) Maybe it wrecks my agenda for the day. Maybe it's inconvenient, like my brother said, you know, but maybe it's an opportunity. Maybe your agenda and my agenda would keep us from the promises. Maybe it would keep us from the opportunities that God actually has for us. And the rearranging of our day is literally like could change the very direction of our life and our destiny. That's a good God. So Jesus says, we're in new places. Go into a room, close the door behind you, and pray in secret. And guess what the Bible says? It says there, It says, when you do that, pray to your Father who is in heaven. And he says, I tell you the truth. Anybody believe that Jesus tells the truth? Okay. Jesus says, I'm telling you the truth. Now listen to his words. Because even if you don't believe all scripture is the same, some people believe that the red words are more important than the other words. But no matter what you believe, this, this should hit everybody. Jesus says, I tell you the truth that what you do in secret, my Father will reward openly. The word reward there, it actually means two things. One, that God would cause a manifestation of him and his kingdom. The thing, you do know, I I can't lift up my Bible right now because if I do, everything's going to fall out. Okay, but if I was to lift up my Bible, or I could get the pink Bible, I could lift it up. Do you know everything in this Bible is impossible for you to do by yourself? You can't, God made it so this was impossible for you to do. It takes the Spirit of God to allow you to do it. That's why you can't heal. That's why you can't prophesy. You can't do it. He made it so it's impossible for you to do this. You were never meant to do it. Some places try to take out all of the things of the Spirit, and, and, they, and, and they try to get man to do it by their own ability. You were not meant to do it because the most important thing to God was about staying connected. It wasn't about you proving things to God. It was about you honoring Jesus, honoring his son, glorifying the Father. Amen. And you know the second thing that that word means in terms of reward? It means to be fruitful. Anybody want their life to be fruitful? All of a sudden, see, like, like the Bible says this. The Bible says that if you're alone with God in the secret place, that God will reward you and cause the manifestation of the kingdom, and not just the manifestation of the kingdom, but your life to be fruitful. In other words, he says that there is a place in God and with the Father alone that is not, a promise that is not for every Christian. It's not for everybody that goes to church. It's not for everybody that reads the Bible. It's for those that are in the secret place, in the presence and the glory of God, and are alone with the Father and value him, that he will do for you, that he will not do for other people. That he will reward your life in a way with the manifestation of the reality of the kingdom of God that he will not do for just people that go to church. See, the issue, see, like, when you read that, well, I believe Jesus is saying, this is my, my take on it, in, in a way, it's not what the Bible necessarily says, but it's kind of like Jesus is saying this. This is how my Father knows who really loves me. It's not who goes to church or is seen by people, and again, I'm not trying to be anti-church when I say that. I'm saying, like, if you go to church but you don't spend any time alone with the Father, that means you value going to church because people see you, but you don't necessarily value the presence because nobody sees you. So if you were going to cut something out of your life, what do you cut out? You cut out your time with God alone. But the Father saying, this is how I know who really loves me, that they have a value for my presence more than they have for anything else, and they make sure that that's the priority of their life is to be with him and to be with him alone. And God says, those are the ones that I am looking to reward and to set apart in a different way because they have the ability to reflect me and for people to see me rather than to see them because they're constantly allowing me to alter and and, and to align their hearts and their minds and their will with mine. I'm going to quit being so theological in just a moment, but go to John 15 with me for just a moment, and then, and then I'm going to change direction just a little bit. Amen. Are you guys okay? I hope you're getting some out of it, but um, I know I'm doing a lot more teaching than sometimes I do, but um, um, in verse 4, this sounds like Psalms 91, but it says, 
dwell in me and I will dwell in you. Uh, my sister, um, uh, Kimmy, here this morning, um, I would be called Kimberly, Kim, and she goes by a lot of stuff. I mean, Kimmy, uh, Pastor Kimmy here, she, she was talking about, you know, the, you know, James 4, 7, 8, and this is kind of the same thing here. It talks about, like, you have to initiate. God calls you to initiate. Like, some people are just waiting for God to initiate, right? That's why I said, draw near to God, I will draw near to you, right? And then it says here, it says, dwell in me, and I will dwell in you. Now, when, like when I gave my life to Jesus, like God chased me. Now, he chased me down because I did not know Jesus. I didn't come from a Christian background. I go to a Bible camp, and I am, I'm the only one in the Bible camp on a Wednesday night that has not given their life to Jesus. I mean, and I don't have time for the story, but like God moved really powerful. But I'm standing out there with my arms crossed, and I'm like, no way, God. I will not give my life to you unless you prove yourself to be real. So, so the, the, the guy that was the speaker, he's right now one of my spiritual fathers, and he, and he comes up, I'm standing out there, and he wraps his arm around me, and he whispers in my ear a word of knowledge. He says, when you were a kid, and you were about four to five years old, you were molested by a male babysitter, and you never told anybody in your entire life. And he says, God wants you to know that he saw the abuse, and he saw what you went through. And he said, you know, he's with you, and he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna bring justice, and he's going to do all of this stuff. And, he's, and, I, and he just kept going on with the promises that God was going to do them. At that moment, I broke. I, I, to be honest with you, I ended up at the altar giving my life to Jesus. I do not know how I got from my seat to the altar. But I was bawling at the altar for a couple hours, and I came from a place like where I had an abusive stepfather, and I never cried. I don't remember crying. And now I am just absolutely broken. My point is that God chased me. God chased me now. But you know what happened when I gave my life to Jesus? He didn't chase me anymore. You know why? Because he showed himself to me. He showed me his heart. He was vulnerable. And he said, here I am. This is me. If you want me, you can have me. It's not God being mean. It's God saying, you know, I got my arms wide open here. And you can run into them anytime you want to. But I'm not forcing myself on you. <clears throat> like, you can have as much of God as you want. It's up to you how much you want. He'll give you as much as you want, but he'll also give you as little as you want. So here he says this. He says, you should initiate. He says, dwell in me, and I will dwell in you. And I'm reading from the Amplified, so that he kind of repeats it in a different way. He says, live in me, and I will live in you. And then he says this, just as no branch can bear fruit of itself without abiding. Without what? Doing what the Father's doing. Speaking what the Father's speaking. How? By being vitally united. Right? That you were one in him. You know you were made one the moment you gave your life to Jesus? Being vitally united. That's about relationship where you get revelation of what you've already been given in Christ Jesus. You know, your whole life is about discovering what you've already been given. You've been given some stuff, but you don't, you don't understand it. You don't know it. The relationship is what unlocks the revelation so that you can walk in what you actually are. It says, without abiding or being vitally united to me, it says, to the vine, and neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. Wait a second. I can't bear fruit if I can't hear from God. I can't bear fruit. If I'm not doing what the Father's doing, well, I thought if I just did good things for God, he'd be happy with me. Well, that's not really what the Bible teaches us. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more here. It says, in verse 6, if a person does not dwell in me, I think I missed a verse, huh? Verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever lives in me, and I in him bears much abundant fruit. Right? He tells you again, however, apart from me, cut off from vital union with me, you can do nothing. Remember how I was saying you can't do anything, what the Bible says, without him? And then verse 6, if a person does not dwell in me, he is thrown out like a broken off branch and withers and the branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire and they are burned. Now this isn't about punishment. This isn't God trying to punish you. Uh, for the sake of time this morning, um, this is basically God saying that anything you do in your own ability, it's going to evaporate. It's not going to last for eternity. The only thing that's going to last is what Jesus does through you. 
Do you know the greatest, the greatest key to Jesus' life was his ability to yield and to surrender to the Father? Like, that's what we're trying to learn how to do. Amen? As a matter of fact, if you study, like, you know, the judgment seat of Christ, that's really the mercy seat, the bema seat. It's about God giving you what Jesus deserves. Amen? He paid for the price for you to get that. But then more than that, you could go on and you could study about, the, about those precious metals, the gold and the silver and the bronze, which is all about the works of Jesus. And then you have all of your works, which is the wood and the hay and stable, uh, stubble, and it will all burn up. I mean, it's just not going to last. It's not talking about God throwing you into the lake of fire or something and punishing you. It's just saying that anything that you do that's not allowing Jesus to do it through you, it doesn't make a difference for the Father. The only thing that makes a difference is when you get out of the way and allow Jesus to do it through you. Amen? It's all about surrender. I mean, that should take away a lot of pride. In, in the church, amen, uh, about like what it is that we think that we're supposed to do. And then he says this in verse 7, if you live in me, abide vitally to me, my words remain in, in you, and continue to live in your hearts. And look at the result. Ask whatever it is that you want, and it shall be done. You want your prayers to be answered? They're answered when you, when you become one, right? Your heart becomes one. Your mind becomes one. Your will becomes one, right? Through the revelation of that, amen? And look what he says, he says here in um, verse 8. When you bear or produce much fruit, my Father is honored and glorified. That's supposed to be, that's supposed to be why we're living our lives, right? And he says this, and this is like not PC at all. Jesus says, and you prove yourselves to be true followers of mine. I mean, can you say that in church? I mean, I thought this was just a relationship where it's just between me and God. I don't have, yeah, it was between me and God, but God knows, Jesus knows, right? Are, are we true followers of him, right? Because being a true follower means that I'm going to abide. I'm going to learn to surrender. I'm going to learn to yield. I'm going to learn to value the voice of God in my life. I'm going to learn to value, like, you know, what it is that he's doing, Amen. So that takes me, that requires me to be in the secret place. It requires me to have a value for the presence and a value for the glory. So I'm going to take this another direction just for a moment. But um, uh, just, just um, in October, I got a call from my, um, my sister, and she lives outside of Venice, Italy. And um, they retired over there and stuff. But anyway, I was having lunch with my daughter in Boston, and she leaves a message on my phone, and she says, you know, um, I have a message to leave, but I'm, I'm, I don't know how you're going to take it. So I'm not going to leave the message. Just call me back. And so I thought, well, it must be bad news because that's usually bad news when people like, don't want to leave a message and they can't tell you that. So I'm like, okay, well, so I call her back after lunch. And she says, you know, I got a call from the coroner's office in Riverside, California. And I'm like, okay. And she goes, they found your biological dad. So if you don't know in my life, I, I, didn't, I don't remember my biological dad. He left when I was a year and a half. So, so now, now they had a call, and my, my sister is a half-sister. We have the same mom, but we have a different dad. So, so, um, but they found her because of marriage records and stuff. They couldn't find my brother and I, who have the same dad, but they found her. So anyways, she gives me the number, and I call uh, the coroner's office and talk to this lady named Marlene. And Mar you know, Marlene begins to tell me more about my dad than I've ever known most of my, you know, most of my life because I didn't know much about him. Found out he was in a rest home in, in Palm Desert of all places. The people that I was staying with last night uh, um, with uh, Ruth and stuff was saying that she used to work in that area. And so, you know, uh, so... Uh, so he was there, and they said he was schizophrenic, and, and I just learned some things which kind of helped me understand maybe his own life was a little bit, like, difficult for him to be able to take care of himself, maybe let alone family. But anyways, um, she tells me all this stuff. I learned some things, and, and, and so and then all of a sudden she kind of drops the bomb. And the bomb was basically like, hey, um, we're looking for somebody to take responsibility of the body. You're the only next to kin that we can find. And so they, they want me to pay to either have my dad buried or cremated or do something. He's been in the freezer since May 17th, and now it's October. And, and I'm kind of thinking, like, man, you know, I think anybody deserves some dignity. But, but I was a little overwhelmed in the moment. I didn't know. I had some feelings and some emotions that I didn't know that I had. 
Like, I mean, it was really weird because I've lived with this my whole life, so I didn't even know that that stuff existed, but all of a sudden I start to get a little bit emotional, but I, um, and, and I couldn't figure, I didn't know what it was that I was feeling, but I told the lady, I said, you know, I, I, need, a, I need a day or two to think about this and then to talk to my wife and my brother, and then I'll give you a call back. So I get off the phone and I call my wife, and I get more emotional when I'm, calling, when I'm talking to my wife, and we both feel like that God is doing something, that God wants we need to take responsibility. He wants to restore something in terms of our bloodline and reconcile. My dad, my dad can't reconcile, but I can. And so, you know, so I'm, so I'm trying to think about this. And I, so I get off the phone with my wife, and then I call my brother. And my brother, you know, like he has the opposite. He's a Christian. He, he is an elder in a church, and he preaches. But he kind of had the opposite reaction. You know, I didn't know what I was going to do, but, like, he's kind of like, I don't want anything to do with him. He didn't have anything to do with us. He didn't pay child support. He didn't help us in any way. He just left us. I don't want anything to do with him. And so I understood. I understood where he was coming from, right? And um, but so I call back this, uh, the, this lady at the coroner's office, and I said, yeah, I'm at take responsibility, you know, for the body, and she gives me information and stuff like that to go ahead and make arrangements for him, and, you know, so, you know, I'm in New Jersey, and I'm ministering, you know, getting ready to go minister in Pennsylvania, so I'm driving, I have a bunch of time in the car by myself, and and I'm just being, all of a sudden, I'm just weeping in the car, and I don't like to tell people I weep early, to be honest, because I don't like being vulnerable, but, like, it seems like God uses me more when I'm vulnerable. He uses me more in my weakness than my strength. I, I don't know anybody that likes to be vulnerable, but I mean, but God does more through our vulnerabilities. We think it's through our strengths. But so anyways, I, I'm, I'm there with the Lord, and all of a sudden I hear the Lord speak to me. Now, I'm, now, mind you, I'm still wrestling with like, have I forgiven my dad? Have, do I have bitterness? Because I'm feeling stuff, and I don't know why I'm feeling what I'm feeling. Is it because he died, and now some ideas of meeting him have died with him? <clears throat> you know, some fantasies that my life could have been better, that I grew up, growing up with an abusive stepdad. Who knows what it was, but I didn't know. I was still trying to figure it out. So I'm searching my heart. Oh, Lord, do I have unforgiveness? Do I have bitterness? And the Lord speaks to me in the car. He says, can you honor your father? And I'm like, What? Like, isn't it enough just to forgive? Now you want me to honor too? You know, sometimes like the Lord doesn't like show you the whole big picture. He just asks a little bit at a time of you. You know, like the word says like he's a lamp unto your feet and he's a light unto your path, right? Sometimes he just shows you the step in front of you because that's all you can handle. And, and, and so you take the step and as you take the step, you know, then God says, hey, can you come a little further? Can you take the next step? And then you have to take the next step. But you can't do it without him. You can, it feels like you can't do it with him, but you're going to trust him, and you're going to surrender, and you're going to yield to him. You know? And so he says, can you honor your father? And then the scripture comes to me about honoring your father and mother, right? And so it, that, that, that's coming to me, and I, I feel like it's an awkward silence in the car between me and the Lord. Because I haven't answered him, and I haven't really surrendered yet. And then a little while later, you know, in the car, God just let us sit there for a little while. And all of a sudden, you know, it's like if you're with a friend, they said, okay, I'm going to go ahead and just test the waters. And God, and push him a little further. And God's like, you could do a memorial service. Yeah, that's what I thought. Oh, and I, and I felt like, oh, my gosh, that's a weird idea. That's a silly idea, you know, like. I mean, I don't even know him. What would I say? I had all kinds of excuses ready to go, right? And, and so, like, I'm not sure, you know, what does that look like? You? And so I sat on that for a little while because then the thoughts started to come to me. Well, what will my wife think? She's going to think I lost it, right? You know, I eat bad pizza, something, right? And, and so I call home after a little while. And my wife puts me on speakerphone with my third daughter, Naomi. She's 18 years old, and um, she's in the background. I didn't know she was on the background, but she answers the phone. And I begin to tell my wife, not knowing this, that, hey, I feel like the Lord's speaking to me. I feel like the Lord's speaking to me. Can you honor your father? And then I felt like he asked me, can I do a memorial service for him? So my daughter, knowing that he doesn't know anybody, the rest home, that, you know, that he has no known, you know, family, ex-wives, children, anything. I'm the only one in the family. She's like, who would come, Dad? So I tell him, I'm going to do a memorial service. She goes, who's going to come? I said, well, you could come. <laughs> Your sisters could come. Grandpa and Grandma could come. We can invite some friends from church to come. 
And she goes, okay, whatever, Dad. She gets off the phone, and she's 18 years old. My wife, you know, she's just willing to be supportive, you know, of whatever that I, that I need at that moment. And so I get off the phone, and just a couple minutes later, my daughter texts me. And she goes, Dad, I think it would be a great idea to do a memorial service for your dad. And at first I thought, like, wow. At first I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, like, you know, that's confirmation. This is not just for me, but it's also for my kids. And then I thought, oh, my wife put her up to that because that's what my wife would do. My wife would say, you know what, your dad's going through a hard time, and you need to be a support to him in whatever way you can. You need to let him know that you're going to be supportive to him, right? And so I call my wife, and I ask her, did you say something to Naomi? She goes, nope. She says she texted the same thing to me, like right after she hung up with us, amen? You know, I didn't know it, but there were some things going on in me that I didn't even know were there. You know, all of us have some stuff going on in us that we don't even know is there. You know, God's so gracious because he waits till the right time that we're ready to deal with things. The perfect time, I can see how he did that at this perfect time. I'm 54 years old. I didn't expect to, like, all of a sudden meet my dad, or, you know, even, you know, or, or to find him at 54 years old, you know. But God needed to heal some stuff in me I didn't know needed to be healed. He needed to align some things in me that I didn't know needed to be aligned. But here's what I found, you know. Over and over again, the Lord has asked me to do things that I haven't wanted to do. Like my mom, I, I grew up with an alcoholic mom who disappointed and discouraged me many times because of broken promises. And, and you know, I, and so I quit talking to her. I gave my life to Jesus already, but I mean, I didn't want to be with family. I wanted to run from family as far as I could and get away from them. I found out you can't outrun family. And you're not meant to. Right? And so, you know, I'm, I, I haven't talked to my mom for three years. I'm taking a shower, and I hear the Lord speak to me on Christmas Eve. He says, you need to call your mom and ask her to forgive you. I'm like, what, Lord? Are you kidding me? You don't understand. My mom needs to call me and ask me to forgive her. <laughs> so I, I found that you don't win a lot of arguments with the Lord. So I just kind of like wait a little bit. Pretty soon my heart starts to change. Over and over again, I found this. If I don't chase the presence of God, if I don't chase the glory of God and allow God to change my heart in the secret place that I can't abide, that I can't do what he asked me to do, I can't forgive. Like, I, I can't forgive people. It's impossible for me to do. Only God can do that. And unless he changes me, I can't do it. So I call my mom and I ask her to forgive me. I get to lead my mom to Jesus. Amen. My abusive stepdad who beat my mom every day, just about that I can remember, beat on me every day. Like we would drive around, leaving the house, waiting for my dad to pass out from drinking too much, and then we felt like it was safe to come home. I forgave him. Guess what? I got to lead him to Jesus. Over and over again, the Lord asked me to do things that were impossible for me to do. And now he used that to change my whole family. I got to see my whole family come to Jesus. And he used the small things, the everyday things, the things that I was trying to run away from to change me on the inside, to give me a capacity to love people that I didn't love. I didn't want to love. But I didn't know it. But when he was doing those things in me to change me, I thought it was for them. But he was doing some stuff in me that I, I needed to have done in me. He was doing more for me than he was even doing inside of them. And in doing the small stuff, he created an ability to be able to do bigger stuff. Because he's looking to see if we can be entrusted with the little stuff, the stuff that we don't want to do sometimes. And they're saying, you know what, I can trust you with the bigger stuff. I can trust you with my heart. I can trust you with this stuff. Go with me to Matthew chapter 5. I'll read one verse and I'll read one more thing and then I'm done, okay? Hope you guys are okay. I hope you're getting something out of this. But it says in verse 43 of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. 
But Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. Oh my gosh, what? This is impossible. This cannot be right. This can't be what Jesus would ask of us as Christians. But it is. It's impossible. Love your enemies. It was an impossible thing to do. That's why Jesus was saying to do it. Love your enemies. I mean, I love the people that love me. Don't you love the people that love you? I mean, they're great people, right? They celebrate you. They like you. They think you're awesome. Man, those are the people you love, right? But to love your enemies? You know what I wonder today? How will the church be what the church needs to be if we don't learn to let go? Because really in the last season of the church, there's been a whole bunch of people that have not necessarily represented Jesus well. It's come out of places of hate. That doesn't mean that we don't stand for the right things, but how we say things and how we behave is very important to the Lord, right? And Jesus says, love your enemies. Wow, who's your enemy? Is it a family member? Is it an abusive father? Uh, abusive brother? Is it a mother? Is it, is, it, is it a political figure? Is it Nancy Pelosi? Is it Joe Biden? Is it President Trump? Or, you know, when he was president, you know, like, well, I mean, who, it could be anybody, right? It could be somebody at work. It could be a friend. It could be, you know, that betrayed you. It could be, you know, somebody in the community that wa- somebody wants to make it back. Jesus says, I love them. What the? I don't want to love them, Lord. And then he says the craziest thing. He says, pray for those who persecute you. Well, that's even going farther. I'm supposed to pray for people that want to do me harm? People that are actually doing me harm? I mean, I'm from Montana, where every single guy has, like, I think, 23 guns on average, and every woman has 26, okay? (laughs) So, like... (laughs) I mean, we want to do harm to people, you know, in our state. Sometimes they want to harm us, right? But Jesus tells us to do the opposite. He says to pray for those that want to harm you, those that want to persecute you. Amen? Amen. And then he says this in verse 45. Here's a hard one, right? He says, to show that you are children of the Father. To show that you are children of the Father. Whoa! Do you know one translation actually says, to show who your true identity in God is, in Christ is. This is how you show your true identity. This is how people see Jesus. Whoa. And he goes on, he talks about the sun and the rain, both being on the wicked and the righteous. And he says in verse 4, he says, For if you love those who love you, what reward can you have? Do not even the tax collectors do that. It's a, it's a rhetorical question. And then he says, he says, And if you greet only your brethren, meaning your friends, people that you know, your brothers and sisters that you already love, what more than others are you doing? See, he says, Do not even the Gentiles do that. And I know most of us are probably Gentiles, but like, he actually says heathen. The word in my Bible actually breaks down heathen. People that don't believe God. He says, he says, even the unbelievers do this. What separates you from everybody else is that you don't do just what everybody else does. You do what other people cannot do. You love people that are unlovable. You love people that don't deserve your love. You pray for people and you believe for people that have hurt you and want to hurt you. And it shows who you are. Amen? I'm telling you, Jesus honored me even when I didn't deserve to be honored. He saved me. I didn't deserve to be saved. Somebody corrected me the other day. You know, I deserve to be saved because Jesus deemed me worthy to be saved. But I didn't earn it. So I didn't deserve it based on my own merits. I deserved it because he loved me. Amen. And sometimes that's linguistical. But I want to read something that my daughter wrote um, for me at the memorial service. We did a memorial service for my biological dad on December 30th here, the day before New Year's Eve. Um, and God, God redeems, amen. 
And sometimes you're just doing what you feel like the Lord's telling you to do and you don't know why you're doing it, you know. But here's what she wrote. She said, there's still so much we don't know about Sterling Rainier. We are told that he vanished without a trace, leaving behind his wife and two children. What we don't know for sure is if or when he remembered his family. This is a memorial about Sterling. Maybe not a moment for speculation, but I feel drawn today to make one assumption. Had Sterling met our family, whether he knew about us all or not, he would not have seen how far a man like my dad came in building a beautiful family of his own. He would have learned his sons overcame and raised beautiful girls. He would have seen how my dad, whose history with fatherhood has been complicated, became one of the most attentive and caring dads out there. One that would drive any distance for his girls, who would care all too much for the people that he loved. I have no doubt that Sterling would have been moved to find this out, if he ever did. And that way, he helped create legacies. Men who would leave the world better than they found it. One way or another, Sterling didn't have the strength to meet us all. I think if he had, he would have been proud and humbled. Most of all, I think it's important to recognize Sterling's life and the grace that we have felt towards him after understanding his life better. We understand that his life was complicated, complicated with more that was out of his control than we initially assumed. My dad leaves as an example of God's grace today for Sterling, who put forth effort to honor him today based on the word of the Lord and his obedience. You know, nobody in that room that day expected to feel any emotion. They just felt like we're doing what we know to do to because most nobody knew him. And yet there wasn't a dry eye in the place that day. <laughs> and somehow we figure out how to honor him and somehow my daughter actually ends up honoring me in it, which was not something that I expected. But God, God will do things in us and cause an outcome and reconcile and restore if we would be the people that we're called to be and let go. Again, I could not do any of the things that God has called me to do in my life unless somehow I continue to pursue his presence and to pursue his glory so that they would not see me, but they would see him. He can do it in you. I'm telling you what, the hardest thing sometimes is to let go. I never feel like letting go. I don't feel like forgetting. I don't forgiving. I feel like forgetting, but not for forgiving. I don't feel like, you know, sometimes treating people in a way that is better than how they treat me. And yet, you know what I find over and over again? Every time I do it, that God does something on the other side that I'm so grateful that I did it because I didn't know what God wanted to do. I was blinded by what I saw. I was blinded by me and couldn't see the bigger picture. Of me. And, you know, I can stand around and go, oh, God, I want to be used by you. Please use my life and make a difference. And then at the same time, I'm the obstacle. I'm the one that's in the way. I'm the one that's making excuses. So, Lord, we thank you this morning for your grace. We thank you for your forgiveness, Lord God. We thank you. Lord God, that you give us, Lord God, more than we can earn. You gave us, Lord God, so much. You're so good. Your presence and your glory, Lord God, is better than life itself. It's better than the air that goes in and out of my own lungs. You're so good, oh God. There's none like you. Lord, open us up, Lord God, that we can see and that we can hear and that our hearts would be soft, that your glory and your presence, Lord God, would permeate every part of us, our minds and our, and our hearts and our wills, that you would make us ministers of reconciliation. 
that the waves of your glory, Lord God, would overtake us, Lord God, and they would roll on past us, Lord God, and cause ripple effects, Lord God, and wave after wave, Lord God, would roll not just over us, but through us into others.